Hi, I'm Julia, and I'm going to be reading uh, The Fault in Our Stars by my favorite author, John Green. Why? Because I feel like it. <laughs> um, I even had it signed at Hank Fish and everything, and it's wonderful. And, yeah. So I guess I should probably get on with the reading. I'm going to do at least part of chapter one. I'm going to try not to make it too long. Okay. So. The Vault in Our Stars by John Green. To Esther Earl. As the tide washed, as the tide washed in, the Dutch tulip man faced the ocean. Conjoiner, rejoiner, prisoner, concealer, revelator. Look at it, rising up and down, taking everything with it. What's that? Anna asked. Water. And the Dutchman said, well, and time. Peter Van Houten, an imperial affliction. Author's note. This is not so much as, this is not so much an author's note as an author's reminder of what was printed in small type a few pages ago. This book of, this book is a work of fiction. I made it up. Neither novels nor their readers benefit from attempts to divine whether any facts hide inside the story. Such efforts attack the very idea that made up stories could matter, which is sort of the foundational assumption of our species. I appreciate your cooperation in this matter. The Fault in Our Stars, Chapter 1 Late in winter of my 17th year, my mother decided I was depressed, presumably because I rarely left the house, spent quite a lot of time in bed, read the same book over and over, ate infrequently, and devoted quite a bit of my abundant free time thinking about death. Whenever you read a cancer booklet or website or whatever, they always list depression among the side effects of cancer. But in fact, depression is not a side effect of cancer. Depression is a side effect of dying. Cancer is also a side effect of dying. Almost anything is really. But my mom believed I required treatment. So she took me to see my regular doctor, Jim. We agreed I was veritably swimming in a paralyzing and totally clinical depression, and that therefore my meds should be adjusted, and also I should attend a weekly support group. This support group features a rotating cast of characters in various states of tumor-driven unwellness. Why did the cast rotate? A side effect of dying. The support group, of course, was depressing as hell. It met every Wednesday in the basement of the stone-walled Episcopal Church, shaped like a cross. We, we all sat in a circle, right in the middle of the cross, where the two boards would have met, where the heart of Jesus would have been. I noticed this because Patrick, the support group leader, and the only person over 18 in the room, talked about the heart of Jesus every freaking meeting, all about how we, as young cancer survivors, were sitting right in Christ's very sacred heart in whatever. So here's how it went in God's heart. The six or seven or ten of us walked slash wheeled in, gazed, gazed at a crepid selection of cookies and lemonade sat down in a circle of trust and listened to Patrick recount for the thousandth time his depressingly miserable life story. How he had cancer in his balls and they thought he was going to die, but he didn't die. Now here he is, a full-grown adult in a church basement in the 137th nicest city in America. Divorced, addicted to video games, mostly friendless, eking out a meager living by explaining his cancer-tastic past. Slowly working his way towards a master's degree that will not improve his career prospects, 
waiting, as we all do, for the sword of Damocles to give him the relief that he escaped lo those many years ago when cancer took both of his nuts but spared what only the most generous soul would call his life. And you too might be so lucky. Let me introduce ourselves. Name, age, and diagnosis. And how we're doing today. I'm Hazel. I'd say when they get to me. I'm Hazel, I'd say when they get to me. Eh. 16 thyroid originally, but with impressive and long settled satellite colony in my lungs. And I'm doing okay. Once we got around the circle, Patrick always asked if anyone wanted to share. And then began the circle jerk of support. Everyone talking about fighting and battling and winning and shrinking and scanning. To be fair to Patrick, he let us talk about dying too. But most of them weren't dying. Most of them would live into adulthood, as Patrick had. Which meant there was quite a lot of competitiveness about it. With everybody wanting to beat not only cancer itself, but also the other people in the room. Like, I realize this is irrational, but when they tell you that you have, let's say, a 20% chance of living five years, the math kicks in and you figure out that's one in five. So you look around and think, as any healthy person would, I've got to outlast four of these bastards. <laughs> The only redeeming facet in support group was this kid named Isaac. A long-faced skinny guy with straight blonde hair swept over one eye. And his eyes were the problem. He had some fantastically improbable eye cancer. One eye had been cut out when he was a kid, and now he wore kind of thick glasses that made his eyes, both the real one and the glass one, 